how do you talk about that? I mean, even now people come to me and say, wow, my son or my daughter passed away or my spouse unexpectedly died. And everyone expects that I would know what to say. This episode is all about where do we go when we die? And, and also bringing children into the conversation about death. So I am thrilled. I have Jeffrey and I have Spencer Olson. And their one of their books is Where Are You? And um, it's a, a beautiful, the illustrations are simply gorgeous. What was the intention behind the book? Well, no, so the intention was to essentially give to children what I wish I would have had when I was a kid, when I had been through the accident that we were in, was to give them something for them to utilize that would help them kind of work their way through their grief. And as a kid, you know, it. I don't think you process things until you get much older, but it's kind of the stepping stone for being able to start that healing process. And so it's, yeah, just essentially what I wish I had when I was a kid and I was going through some traumatic experiences and I had lost my mom and my brother. Yeah. It's funny. The intention was a children's book. You know, Spencer said, Hey, when I was young and it was hard on, you know, people would say, well, your mother and your brother are in a better place. And as a little boy, he's like, no, the best place for mom to be is right here. And the best place for my sibling to be is right here. But the intention was a children's book. We found it's been embraced by everyone who, who misses someone. That was the surprising thing is, you know, it wasn't just for kids. It's a very simple book, but it's a powerful message and has been embraced by all ages. But the intention was for healing. Bottom line was for healing. It was for people to find their way on that journey and to perhaps find some comfort in their grief. Yeah. And, and surprisingly to, you know, to my surprise, we've had more adults gravitate to it, at least to my knowledge, than, than children. So it's a quite more universal than we anticipated, which is great. And within the simplicity, it opens up to everyone. That's the power. And, you know, right? Where are you? It, 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 that right from the beginning, because you, if anyone that's lost someone, and then we're going to get into who and how old was Griffin? How old was your mom that tragic the week after the Easter? And where did he go? Where are you? You were just there. And then you're not. And so to open up with where are you and then breathing, feeling as a child, your mom and your brother, right? Right. Both sides looked on by you that it's just the absolute perfect wording and transition of where a child in the book gets to. It's just a brilliant, brilliant, beautiful, powerful book. So let's the audience, you know, and I was talking to your dad about this is that there are times that you really don't want to talk about this anymore. And but tell what happened. What happened for someone that doesn't know both of your stories? Awesome. Well, I'll lead out, Spence, and then you can chime in. We we had a horrible automobile accident. It's actually been 25 years ago. So it's been some time. I was a young man when it happened. I was 33. Spencer was only seven years old. His mother, my late wife, was 31 at the time. And then Griffin, Spencer's younger brother and my youngest son, was only 14 months. He was just a toddler. But we had a horrible automobile accident. Tamara, my wife, Spencer's mom, and, and Griffin, my youngest son, and Spencer's little brother, they were killed instantly in the accident, and I was incredibly maimed. I mean, my back was broken in two places, my rib cage was crushed, my lungs were collapsed, both my legs were crushed and shattered, the left leg was amputated above the knee, the seatbelt cut through me and ruptured all my insides. I was not in good shape, and I had, I had a profound out-of-body or near-death experience based on my injuries. And to be very brief about that, I was I was sent back, and yet I was sent back by Spencer's mother, his mother who had passed. As I left my body, she met me there and said, Jeff, you got to go back. You got to go back. You can't come. You can't stay here. And we had a conversation about the fact that if I stayed with her, that Spencer would be orphaned, and we made the choice to come back. Now, 
you know, you can find all the ins and outs. I, my, my personal memoir, Knowing, goes into all the ins and outs of life and the near-death experience and life after the near-death experience. The point of where are you, Spencer was only seven. He was just a little boy. He didn't have a profound near-death experience. He had, his mother had passed. His little brother had passed. His father would never be the same. You know, the rough and tumble dad was now basically crippled. And, and so what guided me through it was this near-death experience, this out-of-body experience, this after-death communication from my late wife and even my, my son. But Spencer was a little boy with none of that. And this book, Where Are You?, is written from that perspective of, gosh, <laughs> you know, what, what, what just happened and how do I navigate my way through it? So Spencer, I want to lean in here a little bit with, because I know that your dad has a few different books and they're, they're amazing, but this, where, where are you is, is something different and it very much brings you forward in this. So the book came out about a year ago, a year and a half. Ago. It actually came out quite more recently. It just, we released it this, this, it this uh, spring. Yeah. Okay. So needless to say, there was time for you to move on your journey. What made both of you say, and you bring him forward, because, you know, again, you're a musician and, and you're in the science and in electricity as an electrician. And so you're the science that that right brain more, you're not the promoter in the house. That's your dad. We got that. That you stepped forward and said that this is important to come forward what yeah. made you guys sit down and what made you be this vulnerable to bring it forward well i think it's it's been a very slow gradual process i mean my dad wrote his book i believe maybe about 10 years ago and you know just from that point onward we've more so my dad has just been sharing his experience and it was a about seven years ago, I believe, six or seven years ago, I actually went with him to some speaking events over the pond. We went to, oh boy, we went to Norway, we went to Amsterdam, we went to Scotland and, and, and Great Britain, just all, you know, we were out there and it was there that, uh, and ironically, it was actually on the anniversary and dad, you might have to help me out with this, but Diana, I believe her son spoke up about her death about this on the exact same day, actually, that I really, for the first time in public spoke about my mom's death. And that was really the first time that I had actually shared in public about that. And it was from that point onward that alongside with my dad, I just started sharing my story. And I slowly began to realize that even though my story wasn't as profound and kind of ethereal and out of body as my dad's experience, that relates in some ways to more people. You know, we all we all need to hear and we all like to hear those those near death experiences. But I think my experience is is maybe more applicable to some people. And so from that point on, you know, it's just been sharing with my dad at speaking events and, and doing podcasts like this. And uh it was about two or three years ago that we had started formulating the idea of putting out a children's book for grief. And from that point, we just started working on it a little bit here, a little bit there. And we finally got everything together and, and figured out like what we were going to do for the illustrations. And we had, we had gotten a rough draft or gone through a few rough drafts of the, the words. And then we all just, we kind of had this great push to, to just get it out there. I can't see. I just want to commend you on your vulnerability and also the gift, probably the gift to others to bring them forward in their grief. Peace here. The people are hurting, right? We got a lot of, lot of war in the world. We have famine. We have natural disasters. There's grief. There's grief and there's that now, as as if, whether you're a parent, first of all, let's go into a parent talking to their children or a child, and they lost someone. Where do we where Where do you begin to say? 
how do you even be and yet we have the connectivity of both of you that standing example of strength and love what would you say to them what would you say to people that are what a child a parent that are hurting and how they get to come together you know that's that's i mean i'd probably part. say read this book because i mean <laughs> you can tell them that they're in a better place or they're somewhere but not here or you can just say well they died they're not here anymore and i don't think either one of those approaches are in my opinion the best and so i might you know just crack open the book and and read it and then you know share the message with them which i don't want to give away too much now but just share the message that's in the book and that can kind of get the gears in their head going on on starting to be able to conceptualize where their loved ones are yeah and I, um, I, that's I, a hard I, question dad what would you say well, I, I would add to that because it, it's interesting how do you talk about that i mean even now people come to me and say wow my son or my daughter passed away or my spouse unexpectedly died and everyone expects that i would know what to say <laughs> you know and the funny thing is is i i can't even pretend to know how they feel i know how i felt and and the vulnerability that you touched on, and I I honor Spencer for him stepping forward and his vulnerability. It's 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 a very tricky conversation, and yet it's a conversation we must have. I mean, everyone fears death. You know, they fear the loss of it. They fear dying themselves. I suppose the 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 cheat sheet I have is I, I have no fear of death. I did that. I, I crossed over. I I experienced such unconditional love and such beauty and free will and choice. And yet I still shed tears when people die. Sometimes I, I you know, I, 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 I don't laugh about this. It's quite genuine. Sometimes I'm more jealous than sad. I'm like, well, they graduated. They're in that beautiful place. But the, the interesting thing about it, and I think this is what the book points out, no matter what your belief is, no matter what your experience is, I had this profound out-of-body experience, which for me... And my experience is, wow, there's something after and it's all connected and it's, they're never lost. Nobody dies. They, 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 they live on. They're just simply there and we're here. That's, that's fine and well for me having experienced that. I think what Spencer tapped into in the book is that he didn't have an experience. So that was a different experience for him, but hey, maybe they live on through me. Maybe the way I live my life honors them even if there's nothing after. And that, that was many of our conversations. He's like, dad, I never had the experience. I, I mean, how do you know that they're there? How do you know that we live on? I don't know that. I didn't experience that. But that's the universal, you know, the universal notion of this book is no matter what you believe, our loved ones live on through us. They live on within us. They live on because of us. We carry on that, that torch, if you will. And the way we live honors their lives. And this just came to me too. You know, you might have a conversation with them. You might ask them, where do you think they went? Like, what do you think? Where did they go? And, and start to have a dialogue with them and see what the child says. I mean, you know, children say a lot of really profound things sometimes. And I think they're in touch with things that we as adults lose touch with. And so you might just ask them what they think. But then, yeah, it's, it's probably not a one size fits all. You've just got to share your experience with them, maybe share some books with them, uh, you know. And uh, ultimately, I think the message of the book, where they live on through us, is, you know, sharing with your child or a child that, you know, you can visit them in your dreams. Because I've, you know, I've had loved ones who have passed on visit me in dreams. I just think of them sometimes randomly you know they just thoughts pop into my head and so i think it's kind of hard to to narrow it down into a specific one size fits all answer question i have right because the book definitely came forward much later and and i i love again because if you lost anyone the first thing you do where they go right where where is and, and, and so that's how the whole book starts up uh, from this seven-year-old boy. Did you guys have these conversations then? What did it look like then? We're going back. Yeah, going way back. I mean, I remember my dad wanting to have conversations with me, which I know he didn't like 
gleefully go into those, but he, he probably knew that it was for our own psychological good to have those conversations, but I just didn't really want to open up about it, even just with him, but especially when I had a cast on my arm, because I broke my arm and had to have a cast for a few months, like, and I was a little banged up after the accident. I just didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to be different. Like a lot of kids, you know, and I remember even people in junior high asking me when they found out what had happened to me, they, they were like, oh, I'm so sorry for you. Like, I just didn't want any of that. And so I just kind of tried to carry on as if it hadn't happened as much as possible. Yeah, I think the conversations, I, I mean, I recall one conversation, and this was very early on. This is when we actually had just returned home to, to our house, you know, after the accident. I was still in a wheelchair. You know, there was a lot of things that we were dealing with. And I was sitting out one night just gazing at the stars and and basically losing my mind you know like how how are we ever going to navigate this how am i going to raise this son from a wheelchair and 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 the grief of having half the family pass and i was out there looking at the stars and uh, spencer as that little 7 year old boy came and we were very close he you know he came and kind of snuggled up to me and and uh, I don't recall if I said it or he said it, but we we're looking at the stars and we were talking about light and the time it takes for light to travel. I mean, it, you know, it became a little bit of scientific conversation. And if I recall it, you know, Spencer said something to the effect of, well, maybe they're out there. You know, maybe they're out there. There's even there's even a, a part of the book where it's like, where are you? Are you in the stars? And and that came up because of that memory. And I I I was aware of the longing in this little boy of where are they? You know, they're not in the kitchen. They're not in the garden. They're, are they out there? Are they in the stars? And that's that That was the beginning notions of this quest of, of where, where are you? And I, I think too, and this is an underlying theme in many ways, I, I, this has been brought to light my experience put me in touch with something greater than I am, the divine, if you will, you know? And, and, and in some ways it's like, where are you that, you know, I mean, these things happen and people say, where was God, you know, to not stop this or what happened, but there's a deeper question. Where are you in that? Where's the divine in all of this? Where's the order in it? And, um, Spencer brought up an interesting point recently where he said a lot of it is an introspective question. Where are you? As in, where am I? Where am I in the process? Where am I in my healing? Where am I on this journey through grief? And, and what am I learning from it? You know, I think if we can shift from why me to what am I learning and what's the connection and how's my soul expanding, that becomes a pretty profound peace, which might be why it goes beyond a children's book and even more into adults embracing it, because there's there's always layers to that onion, if you will. I'm going to lean in on that, because the, the piece here is that, so again, you guys were in speaking engagement, and was it Prince Harry, or which which of the, which one of the princes was it that, or, King, or yeah, that it was, Prince, uh, it was Prince Harry. It, Prince it was, Harry sounds Harry. familiar. You talk about vulnerability. Here's what happened. It was literally the 20th anniversary to the day. It was the Monday after Thanksgiving, 20 years after the fact. And we were speaking in Findhorn, Scotland. And I had created a little home video you know, for Spencer, basically, and for myself to remember his mom and his little brother. We'd taken home video footage and cut it together. And, and as we woke up that day, which was a very thoughtful day, I thought, wow, it's been 20 years. And here we are in Findhorn, Scotland, talking about it. And Spencer had come as support. He had come to carry books and to run the audio and to help me with music in this big presentation in a beautiful conference center in Findhorn. And I decided I'm going to play that video for everybody. I'm going to get really vulnerable and just play the home video for the whole conference attendees. And as I played that, I, I even 20 years after the fact, I fell apart. I, 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 I was crying. I was sobbing. I couldn't speak. And, and I, I did an unfair thing where I just, I looked at Spence and I said, you've got to take it from here. Can you talk for a minute till I compose myself? 
And he stood up from the laptop where he was running the music and the video and everything from. And he spoke what it was like for him to lose his mom. And, and he focused on that that day. It was more about his mother than the sibling. And interesting thing is that Tamara Spencer was actually related distantly to Diana Spencer. She and no, Princess- No, come she, on. She and Princess Di yep. were related through Mary, Queen of Scots, as far as the family tree goes. But the crazy thing is he shared that and the whole audience was in tears as this bright young man. And I, I mean, I think so much of Spencer, he stands up and just bears his soul about, hey, I didn't have a near-death experience. My mom died. And this is what it was like for me. And the odd thing is that very day, the front page of the London Times was Prince Harry speaking about what it was like for a man, you know, as a grown man to have his mother pass away at, at an age. And we just thought there's no accidents. There's, there's such, you know, there's such, gosh, synchronicity here in life. There's, there's no accidents that he bears his soul for the first time. And suddenly Prince Harry comes public with what it was like for him. And then knowing that even Tamara, Spencer's mom and Princess Di were distant relatives through blood. And uh, here was the healing of men. That was the beautiful thing because, uh, you know, men grieve perhaps differently. And I don't want to stereotype, but I believe we grieve differently maybe than, than females do. We don't want to talk about it. We want to go in the cave. We want to hide. I, I was reluctant to share. I was reluctant to write a book. I was the reluctant writer, the reluctant speaker, the reluctant podcaster, but something drove me, and I think it drove Spencer as he stepped as a grown man and said, Dad, now I get it. Spencer fell in love and got married and began to realize maybe what I had lost or what I had grieved over. And, and we thought if we can make something good out of this whole, you know, crappy mess, then that's, that's what we're here for. That's why we survived it. And that was the driving force behind, let's do this book. And let's make it about young people and focus on young people. But gosh, I guess it focuses on everyone. We we went through that even in the illustrations. I mean, I, I, I was trying to illustrate something and do something that would be about Spencer's journey. And Spencer said, no, dad, this is not my story. It's humanity's story. So he said, represent all the races, represent all the genders, represent humanity in the book, not me as a little boy. And that I thought that was a profound insight. And, and, and so as the, the point of why we do what we do is that there's someone out there listening and there's potentially a little, little boy or girl listening. And it took you 20 years, right? 20 years plus with the book just coming out that what would you, Spencer, say to a little child that's like, I, I don't, I lost my mom or I lost my dad or I lost a sibling. It's 20 years that you stood with your courage and, and, and you came through forward with that. What would you say to that, a child out there? Yeah, you know, that's a hard question. I might, you know, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a point in time where you realize that life is not perfect and that life is not all happy. You know, I might say that, you know, well, you know, there are things in life that happen that we can't fully explain and that shouldn't happen, but they do. And the best thing that we can do is carry forward having learned a lesson, if there's a lesson that needs to be learned. And the person that has passed, that we take the things that we most loved about them and incorporate that into our lives. You know, what, what most fond memory sticks out in your mind? And how can you live in a way that will embody that? But, you know, it's not going to be easy. And... You know, at first there may be days where you're just beside yourself or maybe you don't feel anything at all or you don't want to feel that and you push it away. But there will be a time that you will need to get yourself ready to, to face that and, and to fully deal with it. 
and come to grips with it. But, you know, life isn't easy and all we can do is, is make the best of it because ultimately that's what characterizes the best of times is when we go through hard things. If it was all easy and cake and unicorns, then, you know, we wouldn't know any difference. And so just as the day has night to have it stand apart and be different, we have to have hard things in order to appreciate and to in order to more appreciate the good times. I don't know, something like that. No, I just I, I, was I, kind I, of winging it. I I think that that's exactly the analogy is perfect. And yes, and yes. the one core piece of strength that you would, because again, from what I'm hearing, it didn't just come out from you. And then in turn, it, it actually internalized. And that's okay, because it's all of how you walk through this journey. The one thing that you found strengthened to go forward, what would you say that was for others that, that are, are looking for just something to hold on to? Both of you, you get to both answer that. Sorry. So the question was, what what kind of what helped me move forward essentially or what what was what was i gravitating to what got you to move forward in that time that said i did completely that yeah to move forward or to get out of bed or that i think what moved me forward was you know part of that not wanting to deal with it and wanting to get back to normality but also i think just wanting to be to not fall apart essentially and to be strong and not I, I i viewed mourning as being weak at the time i suppose or it was my own inability to, to deal and fully so it may be a maladaptive practice but i just wanted to get back to normal life and so that i think is what at, at the time of when i was a child that's what got me to move forward yeah and mine was much different i knew life would never be the same but but Spencer, he, he was the one thing, that's the one thing that kept me getting up. And I thought, gosh, I made a deal. I I I promised my wife who had who had passed on the other side, I told her, I'll go back and raise our boy. I'll do the best I know how to do. And that's that's what kept me going. That's the one thing that moved forward. But we we did embrace the memories. Spence, when you spoke about, you know, he 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 talked about hold on to those things that remind you those precious memories. And this is part of the book as well. Spencer kept a scarf that he still has. And he kept the scarf initially when he was seven because it smelled like his mom's hair. Um, you know, she'd worn it in her hair. And, and he, and, and, and you know, we, we photographed that and put it in the book. He said, where are you? Are you in the scarf that smells like your hair? And in many ways, it was. He remembered the banana bread that she would make. And she used to play the piano. And I knew it was banana bread, by the way. I knew it was banana bread. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it was very personal memories we put in the book. But universally, it's like, hold on to that one thing, that thing you cherish, that thing you love, and keep it alive. Because that's, that's what got me through is, okay, I'm going to cherish the memories, realizing life will never be the same. But the one thing was that I had this child. And I was going to be his dad. And uh, I had made that deal and made that promise. And so on those days, I didn't want to get up. Or on those days, quite honestly, I thought I could end it all. I could just go back to that beautiful place. It's like, no, I, I gave my word and I better keep it. And that that was it. That was the bottom line. Hey, so we're, we're going to finish here. And yes, we're going to, to be the spoiler. So the whole episode so it was about where do we go and where are you? So Spencer, where where are they? Where's your brother and your mom now? Well, that's kind of one of those, hey, you know, those. There's not a a a, a hard, solid answer I can give to that. More of a kind of ethereal answer of they're they're everywhere and they're anywhere. You know, they're they're right here, right now. If if you know, I as soon as 
the thought pops in my head, they're here. Ever you want to call on them, if you're going through a hard time or you've got uh, big decisions to make or, you know, you're just, they're, they're, they're right here. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're always here, but not in a weird, creepy way when you don't want them to be, you know, it's just, they're, they're always, they're always here. They're, they're here as soon as, you know, as soon as you want them to be here, they're here. And, you know, to add on to that, they're, they're, here through me i i uh, trying to be the best person i can be um you know like just it, by like i said earlier trying to embody things that they did well or that they did that made them a more kind essentially a better person that that made them a shining light you know if i when i live in ways that they did they're here as well i mean everyone here's a specific example you know Family members always say that when they look at my eyes, they say, you have your mom's eyes. And they're here. They're there. When when people look into my eyes and, and they're connected back to their memories of my mom. So, I don't know. That's I a that. solid answer, but that's, you know. <laughs> it's, it's I, I couldn't say it any better. You know, no, I had a spirit, an experience where I'll say, gosh, we have angels. They are here with us. They are looking after us. They are watching over us and probably laughing a lot at us. And, and it's funny the way things go. Spencer and I have been working together and, and I said to him, well, call up on your ancestors, call up on your grandpa and your mom and, and seek their guidance, you know. And I know that might sound strange to some people, but it's funny what happens the very next day when I said that somebody had sent me a picture on Facebook or Instagram and they had found a old tree that I'm aware of where Tamara Spencer's mother had carved her name clear back in 1986. And I'm only saying that the, the, the way that shows up where I say, Hey, call upon them. And then all of a sudden a random person sends an Instagram post that says, Hey, look at this. And I think those are little winks, you know, from that other side or from that different realm where they say, yep, I know what you're thinking. I know where you are. And I know that you've called upon me for assistance. And here's a little sign, if you will, that I know I'm aware and I'm right here with you. And uh, that's, you know, that's, that's where they, they're, they're wherever you choose to see them and find them. That's where they are. Everybody, again, I have Jeffrey and Spencer Olson, and the book is Where Are You? And uh, thank you guys for coming on. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure.